Martin, welcome to Microsoft Research. It's a, a real pleasure to be hosting you today as part of the MSR AI Distinguished uh, Lecture Series. And uh, we've known each other for probably 20 years or, or so now. And I've always valued uh, you as a colleague in, in information retrieval. You have a really broad perspective on helping people um, articulate their information needs, find relevant in information, and, and so on. You have 25,000 citations. You received just a couple years ago, I, I believe, the Tony Kent Strix Award in for Lifetime Achievement in Information Retrieval, and actually maybe a, a more um, broad uh, award the same year, for, uh, induction into the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and, and Sciences. And all those speak to your amazing uh, research career and, and impact. One of the things that I um, want to do is, is start, we'll talk certainly about some of that, but I want to start back uh, you know, a little bit before you got into information retrieval. So your uh, bachelor's degree was in mathematics and, and philosophy. What, what, was, what led to that combination of, of interest? Thanks, Sue. It's, it's great yeah. to be here. Um, so uh, when I finished high school, I wasn't actually quite sure what I wanted to do. So I had mm -hmm. odd jobs for a few years, and okay. then uh, I became more and more interested in, in information. How can uh, language convey information? How okay. can I share information with you? Uh -huh. How can language express information about the world? And then, um, OK, I've, that's an interesting topic. And so <laughs> I went to study philosophy. Uh, Right. What was the angle? Just, just sort of knowledge, knowledge representation? No, just right? ph philosophy. Oh, okay. Just philosophy. <laughs> the concept of information, the concept of, of language conveying information and of uh, uh, being used as a mechanism for people mm -hmm. to exchange information. And um, uh, so then after, already after a year, I discovered I, I need math to be able to do this uh, oh, more deeply and, and gain a better understanding. So I, then I picked up uh, mathematics as well. I see. Uh, uh, and then first you do a bachelor's and then you do a master's. Uh. Uh, and so you, you took that, that path. Um, one of the things I, I noticed in, uh, in doing a little bit of background research on this is I've known you for many years in, as an information retrieval uh, person, but you spent the first 10 years of your career looking at formal logical methods, knowledge representation, and, and things like that. You have several papers in that area that are cited thousands of times. I think the book that you co-authored with um, Johan uh, van Bentham, is that, is that right? Well, with, with two other students okay. of his, uh, okay. Patrick McGurn and Ida Venema. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, was is cited 4,000 times or something on that order. Tell me about that, that career and then also what led you to, to think about a very, very different perspective on problems to, oh, to right. work on? Oh, yeah. right, yeah. And so picking up on, on information, yeah. uh, the topic that, that we just mentioned, uh, uh, so there's a natural, for me, there was a natural connection to, to uh, knowledge representation, to okay. uh, thinking about formalisms, to capture the information, mm -hmm. to, uh, and then to prove theorems about how much they could capture, mm -hmm. so expressive power, uh, prove theorems about uh, how expensive computationally it would be to mm -hmm. reason mm -hmm. uh, with them. Um, that then uh, led to the book because uh, uh, the results that we discovered back then weren't in any of the standard textbooks on, on logic. And we felt uh, we, had, we were on a mission. The world needed to know about this. So <laughs> then what do you do? You write a book. Um, <laughs> well, and it got picked up. <laughs> yep, it did. Uh, and, um, and after a while, uh, I wanted to not just prove theorems, but also use these results uh, in, in some sort of application. <laughs> And uh, where I was uh, back then, uh, there were uh, connections between uh, knowledge representation and more formal ways of reasoning with databases on the, on the one hand and with uh, natural language um, semantics on the other. And because uh, where I was back then, the, the institute uh, and, the, and the neighboring institutes, mm -hmm. there were quite a few people working on knowledge representation, formal reasoning, and databases. So I thought, well, there's no space for me there. I'll, I'll take the other route. And so that's when I got into uh, question answering, uh -huh. uh, right? And then look at question answering as, a, as an inference problem. Represent the question in some sort of formal language, represent candidate answers in some sort of formal language, and then proving that something is an answer to a question, you do some type of inference. Some kind of inference yeah. And OK, this sounds easy. <laughs> uh, you, you, then we need to find those uh, documents that potentially contain an answer to begin with. Right. And that, that turned out 
turned out to be a lot harder than I had envisaged. And that's how I got sucked into sucked into information. Yeah. Yeah. So dealing with really the ambiguity of, of language, sort of the fundamental ambiguity of it, yeah. and then thinking about formal structures that you might need on, on top of that. Yes. So one of the early things I remember that you did, besides the uh, question answering work, because I was working in uh, some statistical models of question answering around the same time, but I remember your work on XML retrieval. Yeah. And that's is that an example of trying to mix... Uh, some formal notions of knowledge representation, or maybe more structural and freeform kind yes. of um, characteristics. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because uh, the, the idea was um, uh, these XML annotations, certainly the ones that uh, that are uh, semantically a bit more meaningful than just document structure. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea was uh, these would help us mm -hmm. to uh, pinpoint better answers, uh, and even at the at the document structure level, maybe. Uh, a con uh, say if you're doing retrieval, XML retrieval on uh, scientific documents and you have a, a section that's uh, marked up with a result section or conclusion right. section and you, you find a hit in one of those sections, maybe that's a better hit than uh, a hit that's in the related work section. Um, so it's a way of embellishing the kind of completely unstructured retrieval models that had often been in, in favor uh, certainly 30, 40, 50 years ago. And I think uh, we're on a journey in, to this day of thinking how to blend the right mix of kind of free form, free text information with more structured information. And so uh, yeah. what, what techniques did you use at that time to address that? Did you treat it as kind of fielded retrieval or were you able to leverage in, in other ways um, various attributes of that structure? Uh, fielded retrieval, uh, sort of... Uh, of, uh, almost uh, SQL-like, okay. uh, uh, first find uh, elements of the right type and then rank them by um, uh, by analyzing their content or the other way around. Okay. Uh, also try to learn or estimate somehow mm -hmm. uh, the degree to which uh, the user who formulated the original query would find it important for that item to be, for that element to be exactly the element that they asked for whether a neighboring element would also be fine. So what if someone asked for abstracts that are about uh, uh -huh. uh, a topic and we gave them introductions that were about a topic? Would that be good or bad? And uh, it turned and how out- how did you infer those, re those relationships, the substitutability or near substitutability? Was it question analysis, content analysis, some combination of those? Uh, question analysis, indeed, uh, and, and so, Back then, there was this uh, track-like event uh, right. called INEX that, uh, that, set right. up, Effort, yeah. that set up quite a few of those um, uh, benchmarking activities yes. and uh, with different formats. Mm -hmm. uh, f uh, one format would be uh, sort of uh, content and structure queries, mm -hmm. uh, about so certain elements of a certain type about a certain topic, okay. uh, and other, other setups were uh, you just get a... Um, a content query and mm -hmm. you need to infer what appropriate structural elements uh, would go with that topic. And it turned out that uh, when you asked users, even if they said they wanted abstract about a topic, they would be could be perfectly happy with conclusions about the same topic. I see. <laughs> <laughs> so these structural so, constraints weren't actually very hard constraints. Uh, or, or they were maybe um, more semantic than syntactic. So they wanted a high level overview, perhaps, not so much an intro or a conclusion, or yeah. they just didn't want to be in the weeds. <laughs> Indeed, <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. That, those are really interesting reflections. I want to switch gears a, a little bit to a couple of other uh, efforts that, that you've done over the, the years. Uh, one was, I, you were really an early person, I think in the Trek community, looking at uh, search over social media, and in particular, blog search, and that, that turned out to have very some really interesting attributes in the, in the sense that it was a mixture of content as well as ways of expressing yeah. that content. Can you, can you talk about some of the challenges that you got excited about in, in those cases or the advances in new techniques to address some of the challenges in, in that? Yeah, so what, what's, what's interesting there is that you, you, you had to deal not just with the usual ambiguities that you have when yeah. you work with language, but also the creativity and okay. enormous creativity, uh, which people would, uh, it could be creativity in terms of spelling, it could be oh, right, right. Uh, uh, unusual ways of, of referring to a, a topic with words that typically weren't used for that uh -huh. topic. 
Uh, it could also be mixtures of languages, uh, yeah. Dutch and English, uh -huh. uh, for instance, or uh, uh, interesting punctuations. And so rather than th thinking of this as a, you know, this is just a noisy language, no, this, <laughs> this is <laughs> This language. is language, This yeah. is language. And how it evolves and how we need to. Yeah. 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 And, and so the challenge there was always to um, uh, recognize that for what it is, uh, but make, make stuff findable, nevertheless. So that certainly was the, the big challenge. Another big challenge was finding good assessors for, this t for, for retrieved results. Uh, uh, so uh, certainly in the early days, the assessors were track assessors. These are not typical blog right. or, or, or Twitter users. And so there was some of the early assessments I don't think were very meaningful. Uh, it's, uh, this is not a complaint about the assessors, it's just a mismatch. Well, it's a mismatch between yeah. the, the information needs and, and understanding what would make for relevant sources of information yeah. and the, the background of, uh, you know, of the people who are helping us make that, yeah. that judgment. And so at, uh, in, uh, in some later work, we, we worked a lot with uh, people who do social media analysis for mm -hmm. a living. So they, in a, in a communication agency, tracking, uh, say, the reputation of a brand or of a company, oh, yeah. uh, and uh, trying to learn from them what are influential uh, posts, what are posts that may have a strong opinion but are not going to make a difference anyway. So you should not rank them at the top. You sh uh, so discovering that... So th these are posts that were, are very relevant, but for a variety of other reasons in terms of the maybe they, the influencer, the person who wrote it, the redundancy they're not going to be what yeah or maybe they were posted uh, you know days after I when see. when the yeah. topic first hit uh, uh, the Twitter feeds yeah uh, you yeah, know they're no longer they were no longer longer relevant so understanding this mixture of uh, content authority quality uh, timeliness I think these uh, first of all understanding that these were factors uh, that play a role mm -hmm. in addition to things like credibility Right. Uh, yeah, it was a really exciting time yeah. because most of the IR work before that had been done with well-curated sources like news stories or abstracts. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned just a whole bunch of dimensions that, that people really needed to address. It's certainly work that's relevant to web content, although increasingly much of that is pretty well-curated rather than, um, uh, than uh, I don't know, maybe more informal, more... Uh, genuine and in, in, yeah. in, just a, a different perspective on the way that people can communicate. Are there lessons from that that are relevant now as, as we think about um, social media and how it's evolved over the, the last decade? Think about uh, things like uh, deep fakes of, of various kinds. Are, are there interesting lessons? Because it seems like a lot of the attributes that go beyond content are equally relevant to, to some of those areas. Yeah, certainly there's a lesson uh, from a retrieval point of view, an important lesson I think is um, who is the user that we're modeling? Who's the user for which we're retrieving or finding information? Yeah. And uh, what should we convey to that user uh, when we return results? So for, for instance, for the, for the social media analyst or the reputation manager that I just talked about, mm -hmm. uh, we, we had to indicate uh, uh, temporal factors, uh, uh, sort, of, uh, sort of influence structure around the, the original poster, what have you. And, and what do you mean by that? Uh, the person who posted the message, yeah. uh, how many followers does this person see, have? Uh, yeah. The organization for which he or she works, yeah. how, mm -hmm. how many followers are there, uh, etc. Right. Uh, how frequently does this person post? Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's the whole influence structure around right, this right, in right. individual. For, for a sort of a normal layperson uh, who uses uh, social media, some of these factors play a role as well to, to give that person a sense of the credibility of the information, the value of the information, the, the, the degree to which it should be trusted. But those people maybe should also see other aspects, uh, such as, uh, well, um, there are other points of view on the topic. Right. Um, uh, this is a, maybe you should flag that something is a controversial topic, uh -huh. or uh, uh, or you should flag that uh, we have trusted sources from which this comes, uh, or we don't have them, uh, so that you inform users of uh, 
uh, aspects that they may want to take into account when making a decision, whether to believe something or not, whether to act on something or not. Um, and so I think that's an interesting additional uh, aspect to all of this. How do you make this information actionable? For the reputation manager, actionability meant um, this is going to be picked up uh, at large scale. We need to do something. For uh, uh, a normal layperson, maybe actionability means uh, give that per equip that person so that they can make an informed decision. Mm -hmm. uh, and that may mean show other perspectives, um, quality indicators, credibility indicators. Yeah. And, and I guess that one of the, and that's changed, uh, I think, a, a lot in, um, in the last four or five years. Yeah as uh, you know, the, the minute there's money to be made for generating uh, uh, content that captures people's attention and may uh, inf be from a very particular perspective, um, there, there will clearly be a, a lot of um, opportunity to try to uh, get people to believe that it yeah. is more maybe authoritative or more broadly believed than it is. And so uh, it's actually interesting to think about reflecting some of the attributes that underlie both the creator of the information, the pa their pattern of, of interaction, and uh, do you, do you see any of that in in uh, current news sites or social media sites? I, I know you're not working uh, so much in this area anymore, so it uh, you might a, a bit. So with uh, some of the the news platforms or yeah. news aggregators, they try to indicate, uh, or some of them may try to indicate some of these uh, these factors, some of these right. aspects, uh, uh, yeah. They certainly indicate time. Time. Uh, but it's interesting, it's time since, the, often time since the article was created, not time since you, you might have viewed it or, uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, thanks, that, that was really an interesting uh, set of reflections on, on the blog work. The, the last uh, technical area that I, I guess I wanna focus on is the work that you talked about today during your, your lecture. It was uh, a really interesting and, and broad perspective on conversational systems. I, I think you know more and more with the advent of, of mobile devices where people are speaking rather than, than typing, uh, you see people talking in, in more natural language to information systems. Um, can you talk a little bit about the journey of, of your lab and in, in looking at, at some of those, um, those questions? Right, so the, my lab uh, focuses on uh, information retrieval, so right. connecting people to information, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and the, the implications of the, the technology that we uh, helped to develop there. Mm -hmm. Originally, uh, we, we set out uh, as, a, as a sort of normal uh, search engine lab, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, in comes a query, return a right. rank list of documents. And then, uh, of course, you realize that uh, in many cases, people may have an informa information need but may not actually be expressing it. Uh, all you know is it's, it's that person again, and you have a profile. And so then you, you dr slowly drift into recommender systems rather than search engines. Uh, uh, in the conversational systems are sort of a mixture of these two because there's, uh, someone might... Uh, Ask for might ask a question. You may be able to respond, but often this, the question is ill posed. The, the underlying need is not actually expressed very well. Mm -hmm. So you may, you may actually have to generate mm -hmm. uh, elicitation questions mm -hmm. or preference questions in in the case of a recommended systems right. um, system. And then the next step after that is uh, now what if we did away altogether with uh, the situation where someone has a gigantic screen. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no screen, there's no keyboard, there is some sort of interaction, there is some sort of conveying of information right. and expressing of information needs implicitly or explicitly. And so that's how we slowly, by asking these questions, how we slowly drifted into conversations. Uh, we're certainly not done. There's mm -hmm. uh, an incredible amount of work to yeah, be done yeah. there. Um, and. Uh, uh, what's interesting is, uh, as I try to illustrate in the talk today, is that um, we keep going back and forth uh, between uh, search, recommendation, conversation. Right. Uh, and I think the, the, the conversations generate new 
interesting new search questions mm -hmm. and interesting new recommender questions um, uh, in terms of... Um, uh, you mean the, the notion of conversation? In, yeah, 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 yeah. So th there's many ways to view conversation, right? One of them is just maintaining state yep. of, uh, of some sort. You've alluded to a couple of others of helping people, um, really going back to some of Nick Belkin's early ideas on helping people identify an anomalous state of yeah. uh, uh, knowledge and uh, to, to, to help people articulate what they're, what they're actually looking for. And so th th that's a very interesting aspect of, of some of the conversational applications that, that you're working on, in my mind. Yeah, I, I think so too. And uh, these, uh, there's so many factors that play a role there. And of course, uh, as a researcher, you, you you don't want to affect all of these factors in one go. Right. Uh, you <laughs> have to do a proper experiment. You, you, yeah, you, have, you've, you, you fiddle with one factor and leave the rest as much as possible uh, untouched. But uh, I mean, you can think of different scenarios where uh, you know, you might have a conversation not uh, uh, with a, a large collection of documents from which an answer has to be somehow extracted, right. but uh, a conversation with. Uh, with a single document, uh, you know, and then not just the content, but also the history of the document, the provenance, the metadata. Yes, yeah. uh, you might have a, a conversation with a collection of objects, mm -hmm. uh, and then this, the, the the conversational assistant cannot just enumerate all of the objects. Mm -hmm. if, if someone asks, "What what do you, what have you got?" Right. Or, or show me some interesting objects, no, it needs to f sort of. Um, Build up a ment it needs to build up a model of the user, uh, a mental model of that user. What does the person know? What mm -hmm. did we tell the person before? How long ago was that? Uh, should we refresh that? Can we build on it? Right. Um, and if we're not sure along the way, how do, just you, how do you have a, a dialogue exactly. that uh, disambiguates? Yeah. So, what as you were um, at the beginning of your talk, you highlighted a number of things that these kinds of systems would enable, like a conversation with a document or a conversation with a structured uh, database. And one of the interesting things that got me thinking about is right now, uh, most people's familiarity with uh, information uh, search and systems is web search. Yeah. And there um, we've almost been, well, first of all, it's startling that you can issue a query like Microsoft and find anything that's really relevant uh, amongst the billions of uncurated pages. So it's an amazing accomplishment at one level, but it's also one that's stifling in, in some ways in terms of the expressivity yeah. of uh, what we can ask about, how there can be a, a communication, a back and forth communication to help people identify things. And it, the web has settled on a, a, a scenario that is really ideal for a large screen where you just put a lot of information there maybe different types of information, watch how people navigate through that. And one of the things I really liked is in, in the work that you talked about is the opportunity to think about a richer set of ways in which we could seek information about individual objects, about collections of objects, and, and get much more than here's a web link. That to me is exciting. It's also incredibly challenging. Yeah. It's daunting. And, and so uh, the... Uh, one thing that's great about the way that we now uh, get uh, SERPs, search engine yeah. result pages, is it's diverse, it's rich, it yeah. offers tons of starting points for, yeah. for exploration, but also uh, potentially very direct answers if, if yeah. the system yeah. thinks that uh, that's the best, the best thing it can offer to you. And uh, what you can think of conversations as, uh, okay, narrowing that uh, that enormous bandwidth down to uh, just one thread. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe that's the wrong way to think about it, but because all that richness all of a sudden goes away when you think of it that way. Right. Still, you want to convey that richness. You want to convey uh, that maybe around the, the, the topic of, of Microsoft, there are tons and tons of potential results with different readings, different right. usages. How do we convey that? Um, and so can can you talk a, a little bit about some of the progress al along that direction that, that you shared with us uh, earlier today and then uh, maybe some open research areas? And sure. That? Yeah. Um, so one, there, there, there's a bunch of challenges here. One is um, 
how do we make uh, a conserva conservation sufficiently rich, engaging, uh, informative? Uh, and many of the of the models that we use nowadays, um, based on language models, they tend to be fairly conservative, meaning that uh, they tend to repeat similar results to what they've uh, shown before. Uh, and that's Is that conservatism or just a weird language model that, that you develop because of, of base rates? It, it, I guess it's a, maybe a distinction about information versus a, converse, a dialogue and a yeah. conversational pragmatics that uh, these, these systems have. Is, but I'm wondering whether it's in the model, the underlying model or in the generation. Uh, good question. Uh, I tend to think that it's, of course, it's uh, it's it's a uh, it's a matter of the the data that we use yeah. to 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 train the model on, but it's also a matter of the generation model that we we gen then fire, and that tends to right. uh, to be a very local model that each time takes the next mm -hmm. most likely word or the next yeah. most likely phrase, and that tends to be fairly conservative, uh, and so. Uh, how do you make that richer? How do you make that more diverse? Uh, several approaches. Make that not embarrassing. <laughs> and, and, and not, and exactly, uh, you, and not embarrassing uh, and not inappropriate. Right. Um, uh, that's that's uh, that's an interesting uh, balancing act uh, to perform. Uh, several things have been tried: uh, different estimation methods, different ways of, of um, building the model to begin with. Um, uh, bringing in new sources of information while you're doing the generation, maybe uh, some sort of a knowledge graph in the back, I or see, yeah. um, or in, in some of the work that I mentioned uh, in so-called background conversations, you're giving additional documents mm -hmm. that you can use to to inform the the device that generates utterances uh, and make it more specific, make it more on target. Um, in in uh, is there an so there's tremendous possibilities in, in this area, and it's an area that we're uh, you know, just getting started in. Are there particular uh, scenarios or applications where you think this will be particularly illuminated? illuminating? Is it summarization of things that are going on? Is it really providing people with a way to focus and, and pop and learn about new things? Uh, so I'm, I'm particularly interested in the... Um, in the Provide more focus. Okay. Uh, so what if you, so think about people who have uh, to um, achieve a complex task under maybe quite a bit of pressure. Uh, guide them through the, the complex material that may actually be arriving in real time. Guide them through yeah. this. Yeah, okay. uh, f help them through this. Uh, uh, the system will often tell them uh, what they should know, but occasionally the, the user will. Uh, Interrupt and ask for something specific. Yeah. So these are um, these could be um, this could be in, in a medical setting, could mm -hmm. be in a security setting, uh, or even in a in a sort of a experimental lab setting where someone is, is running right. a bunch of experiments. Okay. So thanks. I, I think this for me this just provided a um, you know a way of kind of popping out of the web bubble and in, in thinking. Uh, about the kinds of information access and recommendation scenarios we can have moving forward. And even thinking about a dialogue with your your document or a news screen is, uh, a stream is really an ex exciting one. So I, I think it's a fun area with, uh, maybe next time we meet we can talk about some of the, uh, you know, the outcomes of, uh, of that research and, and we could, you, know, you, you could generate a whole new, uh, uh, craze in, uh, in, in in for just again thinking about what's possible yeah. for people, and I think that's a, a really exciting uh, aspect of, of this. I want to shift gears a, a little bit and, and talk about you know various aspects of your career and maybe recommendations or or two for uh, you know students or people just getting into this. So one of the things that I, I think of um, when I think of, of your many contributions is not just the the great research work, but um, the service that you do to the, the community in a number of ways. I think we uh, first met when you were, or not first met, we interacted, I think, pretty substantially when you were running SIGIR in Amsterdam. You've also been the general chair and, and co-chair of World Wide Web, CIKM, uh, ICTIR, just a lot of conferences. You're the editor-in-chief of ACM's flagship journal in information retrieval. How do you balance the, the, you know, the time that you devote to 
research versus these these broader ways of engaging with and, and communicating and shaping the, the community? Because it's a tremendous uh, time time and, and energy sink. And, and you, you it's not like you did it once, you said been there and done that, but you continue to do it and help shape uh, you know, the work, and I should have mentioned in, in the course of things, it's not just conferences, it's involvement in these workshops, uh, CLAY and INEX and TREK. Uh, how do you think about co the different kinds of things you can accomplish in those different ways of engaging? Yeah, so, so if in many cases this is about uh, uh, spending energy to get more energy out of it. And so certainly, uh, uh, when you you help to run uh, say a track at track or at clay or at dynex yeah. you know you you try to energize your colleagues uh, and and then uh, together with this group of colleagues mm -hmm. uh, you come you you stumble upon new questions you stumble uh, upon different methodologies for for doing evaluation and so this going through this shared research experience with mm -hmm. a large group of people outside your own lab uh, to me that's very energizing yes that costs energy but mm -hmm. the sort of speed at which you learn is is in a sense much greater than yes. if you had all of that uh, if you had done all of that by yourself with your own students in your own lab um, and so uh, yeah so f I've done that a few times for this reason okay uh, to, to build a community around build a community idea. there's some new work in uh, in Trek, I guess, in conversational yeah. uh, systems. I think there, and as you mentioned, there are huge challenges in uh, data sets, evaluation, and, 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 but this is the way that the community can address that, I guess, is. Uh, yeah, and, and, uh, and you know, if, if someone else picks up on a topic and there's already enough energy, well, great, but yeah, if I yeah. think that there's some energy, some topic deserves more energy, uh -huh. I'll try to push for it uh, through a workshop, through a benchmarking activity, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, and that's it's also good for for the team right yeah. because uh, you you get your your students and and colleagues together uh, and you you set this goal somewhere in the future you run for it uh, <laughs> and that, that's maybe one or two or three years and right. uh, then you let go uh, but um, th that kind of work has been amazingly influential I and mean, some of your early work on question answering was like that you were involved in uh, in video uh, search for a number of years, again pushing directions, and so I think it's uh, uh, it, it's an interesting way that people can shape the research agenda, the questions that are asked, and uh, it, I think it's one that that people, especially students as they're starting out, need to appreciate as an amazing contribution to the community. Not it's not just a paper, and uh, no, and, and, and but also for students, yeah. I think it's a it's a even if for a starting student, it's a great way of. Uh, uh, sort of becoming a master in in your own area by by creating that area, helping create that area yourself. And uh, I often encourage to students to l be on the lookout for new tracks that are being launched at Track or at NTCAR or or at Clay, because those those early stages are where you can make a difference and you can be influential. Right. And they also set the research agenda yeah, in many ways exactly. for the, the community, for better and for worse. I mean, I think uh, there are lots of benchmarks. Everybody tries to get to the, the top of the leaderboard. Uh, but we do work as a community where the light is or where the data is. And so I think it's important to have a direction and an understanding of where some of the, the big opportunities are and to, to try to address those. So thank you for all the work that you've, you've done in that, that space over the years. Um, you've had a number of, of students. Your lab right now is pretty large, probably dozens of, of students. We've had the pleasure of uh, interacting with many of them through internships, through several of them are em employees now. I think of uh, people like uh, Katya Hoffman or, uh, and, and others. But one of the things that, that is true, and I mentioned this earlier today when, when I introduced you, is that your students seem to have this interesting mix of really great foundational work, but also interest in taking making those ideas real. And I think it's part of the culture in, in your lab to work with real people and real problems. So can you talk a little bit about how you pull that off, how you work with government agencies, uh, local nonprofits, commercial companies? Yeah, so I think it's, uh, it's uh good to do great science, yeah. but it's, it's better to do great science with great impact. And so I encourage students to uh, 
to do the great science, but also do this with an outward focus. Mm -hmm. So try to get problems from outside, outside academia, try to get data from outside academia, try to seek opportunities for evaluation outside, mm -hmm. where someone else gives you the yardstick or the, the measurement device and not you yes. as a student. And uh, this interesting um, scientometric work that shows that, uh, of course, this was only published after I've been, I'd been doing this for a few years, <laughs> but some, some justification after yeah. the facts that shows that if you look at uh, publications uh, and their impact in terms of uh, citation analysis and uh, the different author teams involved with these uh, mm -hmm. uh, publications, uh, then uh, you, know, you can see a gradual uh, increase in impact if you go from single author publications mm -hmm. to multi-authored, but from the same institute, multi-authored from yeah. across institute, multi-authored international, multi-authored academic industrial or academic governmental. I see. And it just goes up. And this has been repeated f f uh, across many disciplines, across many universities. So, uh, and I think that's also uh, where we should be as uh, me as an academic researcher, yeah. not doing uh, academic research for its own sake, but uh, contribute knowledge, contribute mm -hmm. knowledge that uh, makes a difference. I think it, it does uh, things other than, that. that's clearly, that. I, look, as, as scientists, we all hope that if we solve a hard problem, somebody will care. And this is a way of, of doing that. It, you know, it's almost reminiscent of uh, past Donald Stokes's book on scientific uh, research and talking about Pasteur's quadrant yeah. because a lot of that was foundational research that you hope is generalizable but motivated by real world problems and it, it's very interesting to see uh, you know a, a lab that that has historically that that focus so some of that may just be your preferences in in research style but it's it's clearly prevalent in you know in, in the students who've who've come through uh, you know, your lab and, and the breadth of your publications. Yeah. Honestly. And so what, what I've, I've been spending quite a bit of time on the last two yeah. years is set up uh, the, uh, an innovation center for AI that okay. is founded on this principle. So it uh, tries to team up universities with uh, companies mm -hmm. or, or governmental agencies, yeah. a shared research agenda. The students in those labs spend one or two days a week at the sponsor's mm -hmm. uh, institute. And... Um, uh, the, our original ambition was to uh, open, uh, I think, uh, four labs of this type per year. We're okay. now at, uh, uh, in, we're nearly two years in, at uh, close to 15 labs. And, and when so you say a lab, you mean a collaboration between a particular... With, with, at, least, with at least five PZ students. Oh, okay. okay. Four so or five year period, okay. yeah. Um, um, and th I think the, you know, the beauty of, of that is... That it also one of the interesting things when you have uh, test collections, for example, is the metrics are defined, the data sets defined, uh, and what you work on are the algorithms or yeah. little bits and pieces. And it's um, you know somebody who spent a you know career in industrial research. I think one of the the bigger challenges you need to learn, and it sounds like you, you know, your lab is is focused on this, and your students are focused on it, is understanding when you have a problem how you develop the right metrics, how you develop the right um, set of algorithms, the right end-to-end -end solution. And so yeah. I think it's a really exciting thing to, to see coming out of um, you know, a, a university. Thanks. <laughs> uh, do you have any advice uh, in, in closing to students who are thinking about getting into the, you know, the space uh, at the intersection, we'll say, of uh, information access, uh, machine learning, artificial in intelligence. What, what do you look for in, in uh, you know, in selecting students to, to work with you? Or what, yeah, what advice would you give to incoming students? Uh, be creative. That's okay. uh, so, no, number one. Uh, be creative. Uh, and uh, be opinionated and open at the same time. So that's a difficult com combination, <laughs> yeah. but you need to develop your own ideas. Uh, while developing them, you need to find a good balance between being stubborn and being open to, to criticism, and then execute. Uh, okay. And so this interesting mixture of, of stubbornness and, and openness, um, that's hard to develop, 
uh, right? And hard to know when to uh, close off for the rest of the world and when to open the windows. Uh -huh. um, and so that's something I try to um, foster in my students, both the creativity, mm -hmm. try new things, uh, be really critical about where the added value is uh, in, in terms of uh, what's a new contribution, mm -hmm. uh, right? Um, be critical, uh, be more critical than your reviewers <laughs> uh, in moderation. If you're overly self-critical, nothing gets you're done. Really nothing gets yeah. done. Um, the, um, at the end of the day, it's, uh, f f yeah, this sounds old fashioned and, and, and boring, but it is, uh, you know, pick up stuff that you believe in and run with it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it doesn't really matter what it is. Uh, just, you know, you believe in it. Uh, you believe that uh, it's scientifically important. Uh, it's something that uh, will make a difference somewhere on the planet. Run with it. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that problem choice, that passion, and so on uh, are, as you say, really important. And so I think it's, it's great advice to, uh, to students as they're, uh, they're starting out or thinking about research careers to uh, develop that point of view yeah. and then uh, pursue it with maybe a, a, you know, a, a focus but also be open to um, things. So, and I see that in, a, in your work over and over again and uh, in many of the students who've come through your lab. So thank you for being here to, you know, today to, to talk with us, but more importantly for the ongoing contributions of, of you and, and your students to the information retrieval and recommendation uh, community more broadly. So it's been a pleasure. Thanks, Sue. Thanks. <laughs>